you know, it's, uh, it's often said, I think, by those of us who uh, are doing this work, which is about everybody here, that, uh, and we, I think we take consolation in the idea that we're making some history happen as we do it. But the truth is, it's hard to get your, your head around that sometimes. You don't realize, you, you, I mean, you do a lot of work on a case, and maybe it happens, and maybe it doesn't, and maybe even when it does, it seems like it was just for one individual. It seems like it was just for that one time. That's great enough. But sometimes we need reminders that the work that we do lights a torch up for people that come next. Now, I've had a real personal experience with that recently. It was my privilege to represent the family of a young man named Tim Cole, who, as many of you know, we posthumously exonerated in a Texas court about a month ago. But there's a, thank you. But, but there's a story behind that. Because one of the most important features in that case, one of the biggest things that made that case happen, was the willingness of the original victim in that case to come forward and work with our project. And it really changed the whole character of it. It made us realize that what we were doing is important. But none of that would have ever happened had it not been for an example that had been made years before, a light that had been lit up, that had been lit up, that showed the way forward for us. And that light was lit by our next speaker and our next next speaker. <laughs> These folks together, early on proved, I think for all, the true damage done by reckless prosecutorial misconduct, by a government bent on conviction at all cost, and they have showed the rest of us not only what we can do to change that, not only how horrible the kinds of government misconduct that we address really are, but more important, a way forward in redressing that and dealing with it. So with that said, I want to introduce Jennifer Thompson Canino, and uh, she in turn uh, will uh, lead the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, speech made by Mr. Cotton. But I, and what we want to do is just open this up uh, for questions later on. If you guys would hold off on that. I know you're a very competent speaker. Both of you guys are, so you'd be able to manage the, okay, well, you'd be able to manage the process. But I do want to make sure we have some time left open for questions and answers. Uh, so with that said, Jennifer, come on up. Thank you, everybody. I don't know how competent I am, but I can speak. So I think it's really interesting and fortuitous that I am back in Houston, Texas, because it was nine years ago this coming June that I found myself at a press conference on behalf of a death row inmate by the name of Gary Graham. I was asked to come to Houston, Texas to tell my story, um, to lend a face, some credence to um, what happens when mistakes are made and how these mistakes are made, and then what is the damage and the fallout from it. And I came down here very nervous, not knowing what in the world I was going to say and how I was going to say it and who wanted to hear me anyway. But it did lead to what I have been trying to do for the last nine years, and that is to go across the country and up into the far reaches of Canada to tell my story, um, my story which started 25 years ago in July of 1984 as a young college student. I was 22 at Elon College in Burlington, North Carolina. And as most of you and most of the exonerees in here, you had your life kind of figured out. You'd pl you had a plan. You had goals. I mean, you knew what you wanted to do with your life. And I had decided I wanted to graduate in the top of my class with a straight A 4.0 GPA. That was my plan. I wanted to get married to the guy I was dating. We had been talking about it and planning it, and that was my goal. That was my plan. I lived alone in my apartment, worked two jobs, and worked really hard, and that was my goal, and that was my plan. And like the exonerees in here, one day your life is just derailed. It's like a train wreck. You're going in one direction, and something happens, Something, some force takes place, and your life is not what you had planned it to be. And that happened for me in the early morning hours of July 29th as I was sleeping in my bed. I felt a presence in my bedroom that morning. I was on the edge of sleep, and 
being awake and felt that there was someone in my room and thought I heard someone moving around and actually felt something brush up against my arm. And as I turned to the left side of my bed, I noticed there was a head, someone's head crouched beside my mattress. At that moment, I yelled. I said, who is it? Who's there? And at that point, someone jumped on my bed, put a knife to my throat, and as I screamed, he muffled my mouth with a gloved hand. Now, again, I say that I was a 4.0 GPA student. Studying was really um, very key to me. I, um, I knew um, how to pay attention to details. I knew um, how, to, how, to, how to look and, and be very thoughtful. And as I struggled to um, figure out if I was going to live or die, and these moments went very quickly in my mind, I realized that I was unarmed. Um, I realized that I was a small woman and I probably was not going to be able to physically defend myself and therefore I made the decision that night that I would try to stay very focused and very calm and hope that somehow I survived. Throughout the uh, rape I paid attention to his face. I knew what the police were going to ask me, should I live? They were going to ask me how tall this man was, how much did he weigh, about how old was he, Jennifer? Did you get any identifying features? Did he have any tattoos or scars? Maybe a piercing, something, anything that could lead, 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 them, lead them to um, apprehending this monster and taking him off the streets. So I did. I paid very close attention that night as he raped me. He began to tell me certain things, like, I know you can't see me because you're not wearing your glasses. I know you're from that town where they burn witches, and he got Winston-Salem and Salem, Massachusetts confused. It became clear to me that he had actually been in my apartment for quite some time. He knew me. He'd invaded my privacy, he'd invaded my home, and now he was invading my body. And to say that I hated this man would be a complete understatement. If I had had a weapon, I would have killed him, and I would have killed him with a smile on my face that night. During the rape, at one point, he tried to kiss me. And I can remember being so disgusted. And I turned my head to the side, and he said, relax, I'm not going to hurt you. My father often says that there is no such thing as luck, that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And for some reason, when he said that to me, I knew that that was my opportunity. I had to get him off of me. And I said, I'm really afraid of knives. If you'll get off of me and take the knife and walk down the front of my apartment and drop the knife on my car, I'll let you come back in. And he believed me. I wrapped a blanket around myself because I knew that it would be important for me to stand very close to him to figure out how tall he was in comparison to my small five foot one frame. I needed to know like where his hands might hit his hips. Perhaps his feet were splayed a certain way. What kind of shoes was he wearing? How much did he weigh? Important details. I needed to know. He didn't go down to my car. He simply walked to my front door, pretended to drop the knife out, and came back in and grabbed my arms and said, let's go. And I said, um, I have to go to the bathroom. Because I knew I couldn't go back in that room. I knew that he would have to kill me first. I went into the bathroom. And as I went into the bathroom, I remember turning the light on and taking a look at him, just briefly, momentary glimpses. This would be important later on. I knew that. I knew that. And he quickly said, turn the light off. And as I went into the bathroom, I began to pray. I said, God, I, I don't know how to get out of this. I'm not sure if I even can. And then I remembered he had told me he had come through my back door. I needed to get to the back door. I knew his way in would be my way out. As I went out of the bathroom, again, he said, let's go. And I said, well, I'm really thirsty. Um, can I make a drink of water for myself? And he said, yeah, and make me one, too, and we'll have a party. I went into the kitchen, and I quickly turned the light on. Again, light became my friend that night. Light would keep him away from me. It would give me that distance, that space, maybe two seconds, maybe 15 feet, but it might just be enough that I could run 